Hi, David Vizard here, and you are watching Powertech 10. Spare me a few minutes of your time, and I'll give you the benefit of my 60 plus years of building race winning engines. In this episode, and that will be whatever we show in the corner there, we're going to deal with uh, the flow testing of Richard Holtner's Chrysler Turbo Chrysler head. What we will be showing in this episode will be the principles that we're going to use and the flow testing of the intake port. We'll do the um, uh, chamber and exhaust port in their own separate issues because there's enough to uh, uh, show in each one to fill a video. One of the things I need to say here is that I had to somewhat reduce my ambitions on the modifying of this head. Mostly because I realized that there might be more to it than meets the eye and I really needed one to section up to uh, take a look and see how much metal's there. That said, uh, I think if Richard wants to go ahead and do a super trick one, then if we can find two heads, one to work on and one to saw up, then I can accommodate that. Now you may well ask, what are the differences between a head or heads for a normally aspirated engine versus a turbo engine? Well, quite a few, and they're mostly fairly subtle. First off, with a turbo motor, as the boost used goes up, so you need to have an ever-increasing exhaust valve size and the uh, ratio between the intake and the exhaust gets nearer a one-to-one -one deal and that is assuming that you're using all the available area in the cylinder for valves. In other words if you had a 0.75 to 1 ratio for a normally aspirated engine you may if you've got 20 pounds of boost going in you may want to see something around the uh, 0.9 to 1 ratio. The other thing is is that if you are looking for good performance at low speed without necessarily sacrificing high speed then the good swirl is needed. Now here's the problem. The style of head that we're working with here usually ends up with flow at the expense of swirl or on the other hand swirl at the expense of flow. We don't really want to give up on either but so we need to do something a little slicker than normal here. So when we investigate the swirl I'll go into details there of why the swirl changes as it does and what we can do to uh, boost it. Some other factors involved are that we need to keep the uh, valves cooler, especially the exhaust valve and port. So coating that with a, um, a thermal barrier heat uh, coating is a good idea because there's a lot of heat in the exhaust and we want the heat in that, those gases to drive the exhaust turbo not to be liberated out through the cooling system. So that's the other thing there. And also, there, and also the exhaust valve gets really hot. So coating that to stop it getting hot and making sure that it's got um, guides capable of drawing off the heat. That means they have to be a good fit, not too loose, not too tight. They need to have oil between them and the uh, guide so that they easier. 
As far as the inlet goes, we still want all the other aspects that we expect from a normally aspirated engine. Well, I've measured the port volume, the port centerline lengths, the valve diameters, the throat diameters, etc. And I've now got the head mounted on the bench. This here is the uh, swirl meter uh, base. And uh, from this here, I can tur turn these here and one turn is 50 thousands, right? Can't turn it and uh, talk at the same time. Uh, that's, I get that problem. Can't walk and chew gum at the same time either. Anyway, it's all ready for flow testing. So let's just uh, do a pull on this uh, port here and see what we get. Well, here we are at 500 lift, and you can see the flow numbers, arrows, are hovering around the 181 to 180, 183, 184 there, um, which is uh, not too bad for a, a 1.6 inch valve. Here's the first working page of our IOP program. Uh, we don't do much with this page. Initially, we just put in things we already know, like the compression ratio, uh, the bore sizes, etc. It's four cylinders. But ultimately, and I've already done this, we'll put in the mean port area, which the next page will calculate, and the flow. And what that does is when we hit the compute calculate deal here, it will calculate the horsepower that we can get. Best torque would be 160. If this was a normally aspirated engine, best torque would be 167 foot pounds, right? The cylinder head's going to be area limited to 160 an airflow limited to 231. So what happens normally is, is we get a, a, a number between that. It's usually about, oh, about 10% bigger than this number. Anyway, when that occurs, that means the uh, head is capable of giving good torque. And here's the torque it would give, or torque per cube, nearly uh, one and a quarter foot-pounds there. Not bad, right? Although this head looks a bit tacky, it's actually better than it might appear. Now we go to our flow test page, right? Here we put in all the relevant data. It's a Mopar 2.2, intake port volume, intake valve, stem diameter, etc. all down there, bore diameter, etc. all down there, size of the ports, right? Now, I'm only going to do one port at a time here. I'm going to flow test the intake and then work on that. Then come back and do the exhaust. So I've put in a provisional number near zero so it doesn't show up on the graph. Here we put in the observed flow, which our program on our flow bench gave us. And by the way, that's a performance trends program. Uh, that we use on that bench, that, that, that big bench back there is what we uh, refer to as our dreadnought bench. It'll, it'll go somewhere over about 900 CFM. Um, anyway, we put those flow numbers in there, hit the calculate, and it does the corrected CFM here. It does the SAE discharge coefficient, the port velocity, and of course this isn't uh, in operation at the moment, right? So that's looking good. Now let's go and look at some graphs. Here's our intake uh, graph. This blue line here 
is the intake valve's 0.25D lift. In other words, for a 1.6 valve, this here is 400 thousandths. And this is for the exhaust, but we don't have an exhaust curve on here. We're just doing the intake, right? Now, that tells us quite a bit, but not as much as we might like to uh, uh, need here. So let's go and look at the discharge coefficient because that takes size out of the equation right here we go well we can see that the discharge coefficient at, at 50 thousandths has gone off the bottom of the chart here which uh, uh, is actually 0 0.352 this is all poor seat work could be some sharp edges due, due to, to valve recession and that but that's bad, but as soon as the valve gets to a hundred thousandths, right, efficiency picks up. And I suspect that the typical shape of the uh, uh, valve and uh, uh, seat are pretty good because these numbers are quite high. But as usual, it drops off. Now, that seemingly awful port leveled off at about 0.56. Uh, 56% discharge coefficient. That is higher than an average, right? And here, and this is what I like to see. This means that the bias on the port was good when it picks up again after the 0.25D lift. So we're looking good with the port in terms of what we may be able to do with it. Let's move on to mean port velocity. Now I can tell you here, the magic number is to have 300 feet per second at the valve lift you're going to use. Well, we're going to be using, well, I'm assuming Richard's going to be using somewhere between five and 600 lift. Well, we make that 300 CFM, so velocity wise, this port's good, right? So let's, now let's have a look at the last thing here. The port energy density. This is a measure for how good the port is for what's there. You can make this comparison using this program here with any cylinder head and it will tell you how good your port is. Well, we've got a two valve per cylinder one here stock and it's around about uh, 25.5 there. That is very good. Most production heads are down here. So, that crummy port is not quite as crummy as it would appear. But anyway, now let's get down and do a bit of porting on it and see where we get to. By blocking the flow with this flow bore just on one side of the port, like so, we can get the swirl to go from zero to 238. But of course, sticking that flow ball in the port does cost a lot of flow. So we're gonna have to find our swirl some other way. We have here is a view looking down on the two ports. Stock one here, modified one here. It's a bit messy just here. I was in too much of a rush to take it out of the cylinder head and it wasn't quite set, so please excuse that. Anyway, let's go through the concept of this port. Firstly, it's cut on first principles plus the aid of flow balls, right? I used flow balls to find out where the air was going here, and it pretty much was doing what it, I suspected, and that was there was a tendency for it to come across like this.
At this point in the video, I've reached a uh, problematic zone. A couple of issues have cropped up. I'm halfway through doing the uh, uh, editing on this, and rather than keep everybody waiting, I thought, let's post this first half of this, what would have been the complete part two of this Richard Haldner Chrysler headporting uh, project. So let me leave you at the moment. I want you to uh, like, subscribe, share, notify, and uh, meanwhile, hopefully in the next couple of days, I'll post the other half of this uh, part two, and we'll take it from there. Thank you for watching.